this may not be true, but I was told that somebody asked Sigmund Freud as he was dying, if he had to sum up everything that he knew in one sentence, what would it be? And he said, apparently, no one's ever upset for the reason they think they are. Can live by that one. Well, maybe that's true about bodies as well. Maybe you're not in pain for the reason you think you are. We're going to find out more about that on today's episode of the Movement Movement Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body, starting typically feet first, because those things apparently are your foundation. Uh, we break down the propaganda, the mythology, sometimes the outright lies that people have told you about what it takes to walk or run or play or hike or do yoga or CrossFit, whatever it is you like to do, and to do that enjoyably, efficiently. Uh, did I mention enjoyably? I know yes. I did a trick question because look, if you're not having fun, do something different until you are. And we call this the movement movement because it is a movement that we're creating that involves you. And I'll say more about that in a second about movement, natural movement, more importantly, letting your body do what bodies are supposed to do. So the part that's about you is really simple. If you like what we're doing, go check us out on our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. You'll find previous episodes, all the places you can find this podcast, all the ways you can interact with us on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In short, you know the drill. If you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe and like and thumbs up and hit the bell on YouTube. You know, you know how it goes. Anyway, uh, so let's dive into how Freud might have been right about things having to do with your body, considering how wrong he was about many other things. Um, Frank, pleasure to welcome you here. I'm not going to do an intro. I'm going to let you tell people who the hell you are and what the hell you're doing here. Well, I don't know what the intro is. I have well, developed- start, Well, wait, you can start with your whole name, which I didn't do. Frank Titus. Thank you. Now, what are you doing here? Who are you? Uh, I, I developed uh, Titus Motion Therapy, and I started this journey from my own aches and pains, really. I was doing squats at USC, and this is after being through ranger school and doing all this stuff. And I was at USC in South Carolina, and I was doing squats and just started working out, and I heard a pop, and I was like, that's probably not great. And I was leaving the gym, walking down the hall to the locker room just to get my keys and leave. And I got about halfway down the hall and bam, flat on the floor, face down, could not move my legs at all. Well, where was and the pop? It turned out to be a herniated disc. Okay. Um, and so face down. And if I moved my legs, I was, you know, in, in tears. And this is after being through ranger school. So you can imagine it was pretty bad. And it seemed like forever that I was lying there, but it may have been a minute. It seemed like forever. And finally, somebody walked by and they said, hey, are you OK? And I'm like, no, clearly not. not. Yeah, literally, clearly not. Dude, I'm like, just, I'm face do people just, yeah, do people just lay down in the hallway? <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> normal thing at USC for people just to face plant. I mean, I don't know what's going on with you, but. You know, I don't, yeah, I don't know what's going on. Is this common? Yeah. So I had just had my son and I was 22. And so I'm freaking out and they bring a stretcher and they strap me down, you know, back in those days. I don't know what they do now. And I uh, got to the hospital. They said, you have a herniated disc. We are going to, you know, inject you full of a bunch of drugs, go in bed rest for three days. And after three days, I was hunched over and bent to one side. And they told me to go to a chiropractor. And I did. And it helped. But I had to continue getting chiropractic treatment for the next five or six years. So it really wasn't fixing the problem. I was just getting worked on. I wasn't getting well. Do you know the joke about the chiropractor's handshake? Grab someone's hand, you yank it really hard and go, see you in two more days. Oh my goodness. Well, I'll tell you what, what I think is funny about chiropractic. But I got, I got accepted to chiropractic school and PT school and because of my you know, process that I was going through. But I just find it interesting that you will lay down on a table and they'll go, oh, well, you have one leg longer than the other. And then they'll adjust you and they'll go, hey, well, your legs are even now. Like, what did my leg grow longer? I mean, what what actually happened? And saying that though, I think chiropractic is great initial treatment and problem. Anyways, I moved up to California, got accepted to a paid internship. The internship paid meant a uh, hundred dollars for forty hours of work. Don't spend and it all in one place. And that was difficult, but my son was out here. My ex-wife and son had moved out here. And um, 
I answered in a little bitty ad in the, the one ads, you know, the employment or unemployment ads in the San Diego Trib. And I started working with this clinic and it really changed the way I was thinking. And then I read a book by Otis Kendall and it showed how physical therapy used to work. And it used to work that you would evaluate someone's posture and you would know what was tight and what was weak and you would fix that. And regardless if it was a foot problem, a knee problem, a hip problem, a back problem, a neck problem, if you corrected those tight and weak things, the misalignments, the dysfunctions, then wherever it was, it would go away. But now in PT, it's more symptom driven. You know, if you have a knee problem, they're working on that knee, whether you are 90 or you're 10, you're getting the same thing. You can't think outside the box. So that book really changed everything. And I moved up to Los Angeles and started Titus Motion Therapy in 1995. So let's back up. Out of the back of my car, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's a hell of an office. Uh, it's not as nice as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the best thing to do if you're living basically in the back of your car is order a pizza from Domino's and make them chase you. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun one. We, um, so backing up to this whole thing of looking at people's posture and identifying what's strong, what's weak, what's in and out yeah. of alignment. So I imagine, you know, some people are, well, the magic question is, what are you looking for is the first part of the question. What are you identifying and how are you doing that? Well, visually, if someone's, I always start at the hips because I think the hips are the foundation. So if one hip is higher than the other, start with that when you look at them visually uh, straight on. And then you can look down at the knees or the knees like headlights. Are they turned out or in, right? Mm -hmm. The angle from the hip, you know, in or out or bow-legged, like I'm a little bow-legged. Then your feet are turned out a little bit. And then are you losing an arch on one and have an arch on the other? foot. I mean, you're into the, the foot and the, I love the whole aspect of your shoes and basically your shoes, just, you know, embracing your feet, not bracing the feet, but oh, embracing. Man. I, dude, I am so upset that after 11 and a half years of doing this, I never thought of that line. All right. Well, uh, I just copyrighted it. So you owe me. I'll get you a pair of shoes. I know a guy who knows. <laughs> <laughs> so then you you look at yeah one hip that's higher than the other and then a shoulder is going to shoulder girdle is going to respond to the pelvic girdle right? right so if you let's say if you're standing and you can move your shoulders but your pelvic girdle your lower body doesn't really have to move but if you move your pelvic girdle your shoulder there you go Ooh. your shoulders respond yeah and so shoulder problems are actually pelvic girdle problems and when you walk when you take a step, the initial movement starts from your hip. It doesn't start from your foot, actually. It starts from the hip and it goes down. And when you take a step with your left foot, your right arm moves. So then there's a whole kinetic chain, you know, like a wave of things that are going to go on. And if there's one little link in that chain that is broken or not working, then obviously there's going to be a problem. Where the problem is, depends on how your body compensates. So here's where we go back to our, my Freudian intro. All right. That, I mean, just what you said already, if you've got a shoulder problem, there's going to most likely be a hip uh, cause or a hip thing to tend to. Right. right paying attention to the shoulder itself. Right. I had that experience. I mean, I had, I'm a former All-American gymnast. I don't know one gymnast who walks out of that with good shoulders. And I had you know some shoulder issues that were going on. And someone just put me on a slant board up against a wall and said, just stand there until everything's relaxed and you're basically standing flat against the wall. And 20 minutes later, some things had kind of loosened up in my hips a little. I didn't know what was going on. They said, check your shoulder range of motion. It's like, oh my God, it's like 90% better, which was the weirdest thing I'd ever experienced. So you're looking for either imbalances or things that I'm trying to think of the right way to put this. And you're doing this with someone just standing or when they're in motion as well? Both. So I evaluate the front view and then I'll side view, you know, mm -hmm. and then you from the side, you can see the... It should be, everything should be vertically loaded, right? right? So if the hips are a little forward, then the shoulder, I don't know which way to do this. 
Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, Careful where you go. One way is forward, the other way is back. Uh, so this is your booty. So okay. the, hips, the hips move back because they're weak a little bit. Then the shoulders are going to respond and they're going to round a little bit, right? And depending on if there's an anterior tilt in the pelvic girdle or posture, it depends. That'll tell you what muscles are weak and what are strong and where to start the process. Because if someone has a back problem where they are anterior tilted or posterior tilted, that's going to make a huge difference. Both of those people, the same set of exercises and expect to get the same results. That's one of my favorite phenomenon when people talk about orthotics. I go, have you ever noticed that they recommend orthotics, whether you have flat feet or high arches? These are two totally different situations and they're giving you the same quote cure. Something seems a bit awry in my mind. Yes, because, you know, I just worked on someone this morning and one foot had a fallen arch and she was a professional ice skater and she could see that. You know, I had her pay attention to that. She'd been through, I don't know, 10 different treatment programs and nothing had worked. And within four days, she was texting me and saying, what did you do? Did you tap me with the magic wand? I'm like, no, what we're going to do is individualized towards what's going on with you. It's not a cookie cutter thing. It sounds like you're missing a serious opportunity to sell magic wands. Yes, I am. I just put out a, a Amazon uh, order today. Good, when they come in, that'll give you something to ask you to sell people. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll send you some so you can use them on all of your uh, podcasts. I'll just trade you another pair of shoes for a magic wand. All right, perfect. <laughs> Eventually, you're going to end up with a lot of shoes. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I love where you just went with that. So this is an individualized thing. It's not mm -hmm. a cookie cutter process. And this is not surprising because you're going to see unique situations for, for unique people. So you've identified, you can see these imbalances. You can see the, whether it's posterior, anterior, left or right. Talk about what you then do with people if there's strengthening and stretching involved. And I'm particularly interested in this because, so I like to say, you know, there's almost nothing that strength can't cure. But there's sometimes where things are too strong and there's sometimes where the things are weak because there's something right. on the other side that's being, that's overactive, a little too strong. So I'm Correct. really curious to hear how you then craft something and what are the kind of interventions that you do to work with people? So I could answer that in like eight different directions. Um, so I don't, I've only got time for specific uh, thing that you want me to answer first. Because I will lose track of. Give me, give me a wacky case study, um, and please mention names and give addresses that sort of describes, you know, what somebody might experience if they were working with you. And of course, at some point, because there are many people who are not necessarily going to be able to come to LA, but I hear a rumor that you're able to also uh, use your magic wand through the inner tubes. Yes, I worked with someone yesterday in San Francisco from my sailboat in Long Beach, California. So if I can see someone and I can watch them walk and move, then I can tell them what to do or show them what to do. I can even send a text video and all of that stuff. So that's not an issue. Even when people come, when I had an office, when they would come in, there's no equipment, there's no hands-on. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that's super interesting. Uh, it occurs to me, if we can, if you can think of something that's, and this is going to be a horrible thing to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Go ahead. If you can think of something that's a relatively common thing that you see, mm -hmm. like in, you know, group of a hundred people, you're seeing it in some significant percentage of that group of people. And I say that because maybe in however many people are listening to this, there will be some number of people who will have whatever we're about to describe. And then something they could do basically to have an experience of what we're talking about rather than have just a concept of what we're talking about. Can you think of anything that fits that category? Absolutely. 80% of the planet has back problems. So working on the planet is hard because the planet has horrible internet connectivity. So, and to see the planet walk, you've got to have a perspective that is... 80% of the people on the planet. Oh, okay. That's a whole different story. So, <laughs> so, so <laughs> that was a good one. You're smarty. Uh, <laughs> so I have people start with, you know, it's almost like a 911 routine and I have an ebook on my website that people can download very easily. And you start with on your back, knees bent, feet up on a chair, right? Everybody has a chair. So you don't need any amazing equipment or anything. And that's actually the position that astronauts take off in. Right. Right. Because gravitational pull is working the least. 
So if you get in that position, everything can really chill and relax. And then the other thing is an exercise I call supine groin stretch. And that's with one leg up on the chair and one leg out on the floor. And that will passively stretch out. You're not going to probably feel a stretch, but it will passively lengthen the psoas muscle because stretch that muscle too aggressively, which yeah. happens a lot of times in PT and training and stuff like that. You can get a stretch reflex. I think we talked about that. And um, we have not actually. So, okay. um, so if you can define that for humans. Well, um, stretch that you stretch something really aggressively, but the muscle in that length, it doesn't know that something else is going to support that range of motion or that posture or anything. So it can reflex back shorter than what you actually started. And that happens a lot of times with back problems. Like mm -hmm. if you're, so many people hurt their backs vacuuming, right? Because you're one side and you're rotating and it's an elongation and it's too quick and too much and it'll snap back. So that's similar to what I'm talking about. So the, these first two, um, I don't want to call them exercises, these first two things that you described, right. lying on your back, basically calves up on the chair. So you've got yeah. 90 degrees, you know, 90 degree angle at your knees, 90 degree angle at your hips. Yes. So you're resting there for some period of time. Five minutes and just breathe and do nothing. And that alone will let everything relax. And then the next version is having one foot or one leg flat on the ground with the other one still on the chair. So yes. both of these are relaxation things to let things elongate a bit in a natural way. Yeah. Is there a strength component as well for dealing with there, back pain? There is after that, because okay. what happens, I always talk about taking a baby to the gym. So what we're going to do is we're going to elongate, let's say, right, this is the correct range of motion, right? You are here. This is where you are strong. You can do stuff. Da, 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 da. So when I open this up here, you are weak, mm -hmm. right? This is like the baby at the gym or when you haven't been to the gym and you do a bunch of bicep curls and you're like, oh my God. So you have to get to here and then strengthen here and then stretch a little more and then strengthen here and then bigger range of motion and then strengthen there. It's a process. It's not going to happen instantaneously. Right. I typically see people once a week for eight weeks and they have uh, canceled their surgery. <laughs> That's a good one. I've had situations where people have said to me things like, I have plantar fasciitis and I look at them and I go, no, actually you don't. Um, they go, what? I, you know, I got this doctor in Aspen who told me and I said, yeah, yeah, um, your doctor's wrong. He's trying to get you into surgery, right? They go, well, yeah, I've got it scheduled for next week. I go, okay, so you've actually got tight calves that are pulling on your plantar fascia, oh, but you don't have plantar fasciitis. And I can demonstrate that and I show them that. And they, yeah. and suddenly they're, you know, running or walking pain free. But then they look at me like I'm crazy. And I go, dude, just because I look like this and don't have letters after my name doesn't mean I'm wrong. <laughs> I love it. I said, I said, FYI, I was a pre med. And uh, my friends who actually went to medical school were not my smartest friends. Right. So, you know, just well, you know what they call the person that graduated last in med school? Oh, doctor. There you go. Yeah. My dad, who was a dentist, used to say 80% of the people doing any job aren't qualified to be doing that job. And, you know, most of the time that's who you're seeing. So I love the, this whole idea that you're going to start in the range of motion where you do have strength and you're slowly expanding that. But so using the back pain example, what are some of the things that you would do on the strengthening side? Because I'm assuming you, even though you have no equipment in your office, you're not sending people to Gold's gym to then go do, you know, fill in the blank exercise. Yeah. Again, it depends on what someone looks like, you know, the posture alignment and the way that they're moving. The level of symptom, you know, if somebody comes to me, if you come to me and you have a symptom of a 10 and you can't get out of bed, that's going to be different than someone that comes to me and says their back pain is a five, but they're concerned. So that will change things. The age of people, can they get up and down off the floor? Right. Um, and the reason why, to me, why people can't get up and down off the floor a lot of times, or they're scared to is because they haven't done it. Interesting. It's not because again, it's like baby to the gym thing. You're trying to stand up, but you can't recruit the right muscles to even fathom how to do that. So there's that. And then there's the anterior posterior tilt. A posterior pelvic tilt or flattening of the back, that's very, very weak psoas. 
Someone with an anterior tilt, that's an overactive psoas muscle or hip flexor. I don't, I don't know how we want to talk about how, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm super smart, but someone. Let's, <laughs> but I don't think you have to worry about that, Frank. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate that. Wait, it's one of my favorite lines. Um, David Letterman was interviewing Tina Fey and he says something and he says, you know, I'm not as dumb as I look. And she said, how could that be possible? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, I'm from Indiana and we used to watch David Letterman. Oh, yeah. On, when he was a channel. weatherman. Yes. And yeah. he was awesome back then. <laughs> he would interview people on the street and he was just, I, I just love David Letterman. So I'm glad you brought it around to Indiana. It always lands in Indiana. People don't know that. Yeah. Like Dan Quayle, potato, <laughs> potato. Anyway, so, someone who has, let's say, a posterior or flattening of their low back, mm -hmm. we might start with just having them stand against the wall. And a lot of times they're so, I mean, turn sideways, they're so rounded through here and tilted under in their back. Just to stand against the wall is sometimes impossible. To right. get their head back there. And when they get their head back there, they're pulling it back and looking up here because it's so rounded. Right. So what you do, what you're basically doing is just re-engaging all the muscles that are supposed to hold them up in the vertical position. And then you can do glute contractions or abductor presses or scapular contractions, all from just that position. And after that, they will feel better. And they're like, you know, I, I didn't know that, or, or they didn't know that they couldn't put their head back against the wall without, you know, looking way up. Right. Here's a weird question for you. So a lot of these patterns that we get into, I mean, obviously they don't happen immediately. Usually they happen over time. Mm -hmm. They, we become somewhat, I would argue, unconsciously identified with them. They're part of our sense of self. Yes. So when you're having people discover this sort of new alignment, if you will, or this mm -hmm. new relationship with certain parts of their body, some that are weak um, and are getting stronger, some that are overly stressed and are starting uh -huh. to relax, have you seen people experience any changes or even difficulties with sort of that, you know, who am I now if I'm not the person with rounded shoulders, a, you know, flattened posterior tilted pelvis, et cetera, or is it really, is it just, you know, all hallelujah, chorus, angels flying, unicorn dust, et cetera? It's mostly unicorn dust. And how do you clean, I'm just kidding. How, how do you clean up the unicorn dust in your office? Because I went to Home Depot and I could not find a good unicorn dust pan. What? There's the, one of those vacuum things you put on the bucket. Uh, uh, okay. All right. I have, I'll look for that. So but but wait, anyway, wait. but back to the point, things change differently with different people. Some people have, have held on to emotional things and, and they guarded themselves. And when you start mm -hmm. opening things up, there can be a really big emotional release. And on the other side, I, I would say like myself, like, you know, I grew up on a farm. So when my something hurt, we didn't talk about it because, you know, grandpa would hit the other hand and go, yeah, how's was that first one hurt. And you just go through it. And so when my back started hurting, I was more like, this is just my life. So you just go through the process and you're like, oh, you know, this is just how I'm going to hurt. And da, da, da. But in reality, when you start getting better through this process, you realize, at least I did, first of all, you're fixing yourself. Like I'm not really doing anything. I'm showing just people how to use the hammer. They have to go home and use it. Right. Uh, you don't realize how good you can feel. That's, I think, a big, a very big thing that people just go through the process every day and they go get treatment, but they're not getting well. And in this process, people realize, well, I, I didn't realize that I could, you know, take care of myself and feel that's this. A, that's a really interesting situation because, you know, we've grown up in a culture that, thanks to the magic of um, marketers, has really given us the idea that there's a simple solution to everything and it's just buying the right product. And the idea that you need to change something about you right. is yeah. like the antithesis right. of what we are often looking for. How do you talk about that? Well, rather than taking responsibility for your own yeah. stuff, you're trying to get fixed mm -hmm. by something else. And I think for me, and I think most of my patients, it's very empowering to know that if you do this process and you continue on even after you're out of pain, that you can heal yourself. Right. And it's very empowering, meaning um, it builds confidence. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it really changes the whole aspect of all that. And again, they don't you I use no equipment. So if you're camping in Yosemite, then you can do most of these things. The do you ever I don't know if that answered your question? No, it did actually. But do you do you ever have people who come to you who are, let's say, so committed to being a problem that just needs a solution that they're, you know, unwilling to just do the simple things that you're asking them to do? Or, you know, they they'd rather have the identity of the broken person who's looking for the magic fix than actually taking that kind of responsibility. Absolutely. Well, and what do you do in that situation? Do you just kind of wipe your hands of it? Or, I mean, it's, it must be. It, it, it really depends on the, again, on the situation because yeah. there's psychological aspects and emotional. I mean, those are similar stressful aspects, inactivity, overactivity. There's all these different things. And I have found that people that use, I mean, I used to use insurance. People that used insurance and depended only on insurance didn't do their routines <laughs> because they had no skin in the game. Yeah. People that were on workers comp didn't do their exercises and were afraid to say that they were feeling better because some people's situations, that's their total income. So they were afraid to lose that income. Now, I'm not saying everybody, nothing is a blanket statement, but people that pay have the, they are in. They're more in and complete and they will continue on. And, you know, I tell people to come back every six months or so to make sure you're doing it right. And it puts responsibility on them to uh, actually do it. You know, they're like, oh, I'm going to see Frank in a month. I better start doing my stuff. Yeah, I wrote a joke about that in my head this morning. It's like I always schedule a a dental cleaning like two months after my birthday, because that way my birthday reminds me I got to start flossing again. So I'm not embarrassing myself. <laughs> that is a good one. Yeah. And now keep in mind, my dad was a dentist. So this is still my <laughs> so, um, I'm still so he's, he's cringing right now while he watches this. That would be tricky since he died seven years ago. Thanks for bringing that up, Frank. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cut. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I'm so um, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. So um it's been seven years. You just said something that um oh I have a friend who's a, a doctor. Do you know what prolotherapy is? Yes. So for people who don't know, prolotherapy, you're injecting the ligaments and tendons um to basically initiate a healing response. And I, I was asking my friend Tom, who's the guy who taught prolotherapy to most people in America, I said, you know, where's the research about prolotherapy? Because I can tell you the research. I charge four hundred and fifty dollars per shot. It's excruciatingly painful and people come back for more. <laughs> and it was something that, you know, that saved my knee. I'd blown out my knee and ripped up a bunch of things and two prolotherapy treatments after two years of physical therapy and suddenly everything was better. But anyway, point being, I love what you're saying that when you do have some skin in the game and you experience the results, that really is, you know, sort of the holy grail, if you will. And people can argue with it and blah, 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 blah. There was some other question I was going to ask. So what are the things that when people walk in the door and they don't really know a lot about what you do other than they've heard that you can help them with the pain they're in, are there any sort of like myths about health, wellness, fitness, healing, et cetera, that you run into that you have to debunk? I mean, we're all about debunking mythology on this podcast. Anything you can think of in the, let's call it physical therapy world, other than the things we've already talked about, like symptomology, et cetera, that that you run into that you find yourself going, I can't believe people believe this and you have to respond to? Yeah. Prolotherapy. <laughs> All right. Good call. Good call. <laughs> it's called PRP and not the prolotherapy. Oh, well, let me, before you say it, when yeah. I asked my friend Tom about PRP, platelet rich plasma therapy, whatever they're calling it, right. um, he said, yeah, it's just prolo for people who don't know how to do prolo and the platelet part is complete hand waving. Right. So I worked on Kobe Bryant mm-hmm. in 2011 And that was the only year that he had zero injuries. And if you look at like 2010, he was really having trouble getting lift and, you know, dunking and and all these things. And 2011, I worked on what was great was I got to see my work on screen, you know, three times a week. And he was doing 360s and all of these things. But the German doctor that was doing the PRP or prolotherapy, he had paid Kobe thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars to talk about it all the time. Well, Kobe decided to go that direction rather than with me and Tim Grover, who was uh, Michael Jordan's 
trainer and he was Kobe's trainer for seven years and he dropped us. And after that, Kobe's career went down and south. And, and I actually sent a email to the Lakers and to his assistant and to him and to Rob Palenka, his agent, and said, look, because he had torn his Achilles. Mm. And I said, you know, I've watched him on, on TV. And I email said, you guys are paying too much attention to the Achilles and not the function of what's going on in his knee. Within two weeks, his knee gave out and he had to have knee surgery. But there's so many different stories about that. I mean, even Alex Rodriguez, he did the prolotherapy for his hip. But if you don't change the function right. or the, of your whole body, then yeah. it's not going to fix it indefinitely. So Alex Rodriguez had to have hip replacement. And, you know, backing up to, you know, my dad's line, 80% of the people don't know how to do it. The thing that happened with PRP is that it gave people who really didn't understand how or when to use something like prolotherapy, the ability to A, do it without training and B, get like backing up, get insurance money. That right. was sort of the magic thing about PRP is they figured out a way to make it insurable by right. adding the plasma part, which is the part that does absolutely nothing. So but it, to me, it, I mean, obviously it works. I mean, it will definitely help. Yeah. But it's like, again, go back to like a hinge on a door. If it that hinge is misaligned and yeah. you just put a bunch of oil on it, it's still misaligned and inevitably or, you know, it, it's going to break down. I mean, well, the way I'd frame Prolo is when there's a situation where, I mean, Tom's very clear about it. The thing that Prolo is good for is ligament laxity often as a result of an injury where, you know, your body is going to heal for enough time till you're functional again, but not back to where you should be. But people are again, over prescribing this, if you will, because it's the new fun thing that they know how to do is look at an ultrasound and stick a needle in you. Right. And, but if you did that and right. this, yes. it will... I'm sure it will work better than this and it will work better than that. Yeah. The right time and right place and the right instrument. But, and that's part of my treatment is basically no other modality is going to interfere with what I'm going to do. Like if you want to go right. continue to get acupuncture or a chiropractic adjustment or whatever, I'm still doing, going to do the same thing. Right. And it will get better. And I don't really need applause, just send a lot of money. I like the way that works. So after you started figuring this out, and this kind of, you know, you started putting this together how long ago? I started, I think 92 is when I got out of college and came out here. I came out to San Diego. And then 95 is when I started working out of my car <laughs> and started my own business up in Los Angeles. Because there's nothing people trust more than a medical practitioner working out of his car. Or a medical practitioner working out of my sailboat. So yeah, yeah. I get yeah. it. A sailboat's a little better than working out of your car. <laughs> um, so in those 20-ish years, what have you sort of, how has it evolved and what have you discovered that was surprising to you? So many things. I think probably the most amazing part is that Oh gosh, that's a really loaded question. It is because I got accepted to chiropractic school and physical therapy school. And that's what kind of worked, helped with me, with my aches and pains, how uneducated I really was and how I think chiropractic has a really good sense of how to sell, sell things because I don't think an ongoing treatment plan with a chiropractor is good. It's like taking a laxative for the rest of your life, you know, it, because I mean, some people need it, but what happens is if you keep taking laxatives, then the muscles that are supposed to help with that, they stop working. Yeah. So the same with chiropractic. If you just go in and have them put you in the right position, yeah. the muscles that are supposed to do that will quit doing that. And so now you're reliant on that. And then the physical therapy aspect, it was, it was amazing to me. I had to un really unlearn a lot of stuff. It was amazing that it was so symptom oriented. Mm -hmm. And we, we talked about that already. And the other thing I think is, you know, the people that when I first started working, it was the people that no one else could fix. And so then they would send me these people. And then I was still had the ability 95% of the time to keep people out of surgery that was scheduled for the surgery. So it was people continue to get worked on and they don't get well. 
So here's perhaps the most important question of the time that we've had together that I can't believe it's taken me this long to ask. What's with the antique telescope behind you? That is uh, Ben's creation. Uh, <laughs> the guy that introduced. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm looking for the, you know, the meaning of life. I, uh, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> yeah, you know, you need a much bigger telescope for that. <laughs> um, or much smaller. One of those. You either need a, uh, yeah. or a smaller one. Hard to say which. So given that what you're describing is in some ways kind of radical compared to what many other people are doing when they're treating the same kind of people who come to you, what's next for getting the word out? Well, things like this. I have a website, TitusBushTherapy.com. I have a YouTube, I, you know, I have all that stuff. But I'm also my planning to start teaching this um, to people so that I can, you know, sail around the world and, and just teach and relax and grow my hair out as long as yours. Yeah, it's going to take a while. I, <laughs> uh, I trust me. Um, have you tried teaching other people how to do this yet? Yes. What's before, that been like? Well, the, before the recession in 08, Ben helped me get a radio show. And for two and a half years in Los Angeles, we had the number one live talk radio show in all of Los Angeles. And we started getting 40 new patients a week. Wow. And it was, yeah, it was a really big deal. And we had three facilities and I had 12 therapists. So I, I taught all of those people, you know, I would just kind of oversee what was going on. And so, yeah, I, I've done that, but I wanted to get it a little bit more, you know, organized mm -hmm. and teachable so that, you know, I could teach more and more people. And now I can do it online and all that stuff. It's intriguing to me thinking about teaching because again, back to this thing of, you know, whether people have eyes to see, you know, your, your, if the fundamental diagnostic mm. process, if you will, is really looking at someone's body at how it stands, how it moves. I've seen certainly with coaches of various kinds, you know, some people have good eyes, some people not so good. Some people yeah. are you know, how do you deal with that when you're looking to find other people to take what you've done and move it out into the world? That is a great question. And I'm going to be so humble right now, because when I started in that clinic in San Diego, because I thought I was going to PT school or chiropractic school, I started this job just to have a job and to be able to, you know, pay the rent. And I remember I was sitting behind this therapist and he was moving the cursor and changing how people's the person's posture looked and this and that and the other and i remember standing <laughs> this is no joke i remember standing behind him and thinking oh my god i will never be able to do this <laughs> and how long can i fake it before i'm fired so you you really have to my process was yet to unlearn and my process also is to just to make it simple and right. start simple. And, you know, now people, would, I would say it on the radio show, I would say you could walk across the room and I, I could tell you where your aches and pains are. Right. And people would literally come and test me. <laughs> and they'd be like, well, what do you think? I'm not, I'm not filling out this med medical history thing. And I would watch him and I'd tell him, I'm like, all right, how do I sign up? <laughs> That's great. If you can teach me, uh, yeah, I think I can teach you. Well, see, yeah, that's the humble part because often we have some unusual, idiosyncratic, you know, unique to us thing that we don't recognize is special right. about us that, yeah. that allows us to do, in this case, what you're doing. I mean, you know, like my weird thing is I've been good at teaching movement to people since I was like seven or eight. I mean, I remember, you know, was doing it then because for whatever reason, I've got a knack for identifying what the kind of common factor for some movement is. And the things that I've learned over the years, tap dancing, Zen archery, yoga, Tai Chi, I mean, a whole list of things. I usually end up teaching them relatively soon after I start to learn them because I can just sort of spot those things. But I also see, I used to um, travel quite a bit and I'd go to Aikido schools and I discovered that the guy who was running the school did not know anything about what he was doing. And, and I would discover this unfortunately, by you know pointing it out to him at his own school, which led to things like people trying to break my arm or dislocate my shoulder because I thought everyone was interested in knowing the truth, but instead they just wanted to make sure they looked good in front of their students. So that was that was problematic. 
<laughs> well, I get that. I've worked on a lot of people that are professional athletes, the Olympic athletes or whatever, and I can humble them within a few minutes because if I look at them, I can see where the weaknesses are and what they actually need to do. So it's, it's interesting to, I remember a guy in San Diego, he was like the, he was a police officer and he was like the squat champion of California or something. And I put him into a position that actually used his thighs, but <laughs> in a total different position. And I put a, a little old lady, probably she's my age now, but back when I was younger, no, she was probably 70. And I put her next to him against the wall and she had been through the whole treatment. So I knew she was able to do it. Yeah. And he lasted a little over a minute and she lasted like over two minutes. I'm like, okay, are you ready to figure out that I know more than you and that there it. are some weak areas that need to be, you know, fixed just like what you're saying. Yeah. Was this like doing like a wall sit? Yes. Yeah, similar. Yeah. The way I do it is going to be different than what she's learned. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Are you going to say nothing more after I say, oh, really, a third time? No. Oh, really? That's what I'm saying. Damn it. <laughs> Throw me a bone. I'm so curious now. Well, we can do it later and you could video it and All right. whatever, but you'd have to move the, change the wall and do that. I, I got, there's, there, the wall goes beyond what you can see on the screen. Uh, yeah. Believe it or not, there's things that extend beyond your field of vision. It's a crazy thing. I don't know what's behind the screen behind you for all well, I know. I, uh, it's just a bunch of telescopes. Oh, uh, I was going to say that's where you keep the bodies. Well, I didn't want to say that out loud. <laughs> I appreciate it. Your secret's safe with me. No one's listening. I promise. Oh, good. Good. So, <laughs> Get the trunk open, guys. <laughs> get a bigger car next time. I know. That was huge. Get, where's the bleach? <laughs> I can't believe we ran out of lie again. <laughs> right, we can keep doing this all day. So this has been a total, total pleasure and really intriguing and I can only imagine, but I'm sure I won't have to imagine. There are people who are listening or watching who are having some sort of ache or pain or something that has plagued them that hopefully now they're going to go, hmm, this is something I might want to check out and see if this is a better solution, me taking responsibility under the guidance of someone who knows how to see, how might they find you? I know you've already said it, but now let's do this in a condensed fashion. Tell people how to track you down and find out what you're doing and how they can be helped with you. Well, the easiest way is Titus Motion Therapy, now my name, T-I-T-U-S, and uh, motiontherapy.com. And you can just Google that, or you could Google my name, Frank Titus, or... I have no problem with anyone calling me. My cell and home and office number are all the same, 310-753-2011. And I would love to uh, offer you a free session mm -hmm. and maybe we could trade for a beautiful pair of shoes. Uh, we could trade for any kind of shoes. So <laughs> I appreciate that. That sounds delightful. I'm always up to exploring and discovering something about what my body is or isn't doing. And by the way, when you give out your phone number like that, I do the same thing. I send out an email that uh, to people when they join our list and say, you know, if you right. want to contact me, here's my number. Uh, a couple times a week, I get phone calls that sound like this. Hello, this is Stephen. Oh my God. I imagine you get the same. Right. They're like, oh, it's actually you? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's my favorite. I don't have anything to hide. So just give me a buzz. I feel the same way. Well, Frank, this has been a total, total pleasure. I hope people do avail themselves of um, what you're doing and experience the benefits of doing that. For everyone who's listening, thank you for being here. As always, if you want to find out more about what we're doing with the Movement Movement, like I said at the top, go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com. If you have any requests, anyone you think should be on the show, if you want to tell me I've got my head up my butt, anything you want to share directly, you can drop me an email at move at join the movement movement. Com. I'm not handing out my phone number on this one because I'm a little tired right now, but it's findable. And other than that, um, I can't think of anything other than, as I love to say at the end of everything, please go out, have fun, and live life feet first.